Now I'd like to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Aluri, if you could turn on your camera and join us. Um, Dr. Sweta Aluri, hello there, is a uh, board is a cardiologist here at Inova Shar Heart and Vascular. She is board certified in general cardiology, echocardiography, nuclear cardio cardiology, and internal medicine. It's a mouthful. She did uh, she received her medical education at Jefferson College and uh, did her residency and fellowship up in New York at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Dr. Lurie joined uh, Nova Shar Heart and Vascular in 2023, but has been practicing medicine since 2014. Prior to coming here, she was the medical director of, out, of the outpatient vascular lab at Winchester Cardiology and Vascular Medicine in Winchester, Virginia. Dr. Aluri sees uh, patients in Inova Cardiology's Ashburn office and is on staff at Inova Fairfax, Fair Oaks, and Loudoun Hospitals. With that introduction, Dr. Aluri, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Levy. I'll go ahead and share my screen as well as PowerPoint here. Okay, so good evening, everyone. As Dr. Levy mentioned, my name is Swetha Luri. I'm an non-invasive cardiologist, and I it is my pleasure to talk to you today about the role of cholesterol and lipid management in preventing and managing heart disease. As a non-invasive cardiologist or general cardiologist, one of my key areas of interest is preventative cardiology. So management of high cholesterol is a big part of that. So I'm excited to talk to you all about this. Okay, so let's start with the basics. What is cholesterol? So cholesterol in and of itself is not necessarily bad. It's an essential component of our body. It helps form cells in our body. It's produced by the liver and it's involved in production of hormones and vitamins. But we also get cholesterol from the food that we eat. And especially in the developed country, our diet results in us eating excessive amount of, uh, of cholesterol resulting in high cholesterol levels. Um, we know that high cholesterol increases the risk of heart disease. And I think this diagram sort of depicts that in better detail. Um, and this is important because heart disease is unfortunately the leading cause of death amongst men and women in the United States and worldwide. Uh, high cholesterol is associated with the development of fatty deposits along the walls of your the arteries or the blood vessels. And as you can see on the diagram in the top two, the left side is a normal artery or normal blood vessel. And as there is high cholesterol levels in the blood that results in fatty deposits, that yellow plaque that you start to see forming the inside of the lumen. So as that plaque starts to progress and get bigger, it starts to of course obstruct the lumen of that vessel or the opening of the vessel. And in some cases, especially when it's fragile, it can rupture and cause blood clot formation. And that's what ultimately results in what we know is a heart attack or a stroke. Um, so let's talk about the different types of cholesterol because not all cholesterol is created equally. Um, I'm sure if ever, you've ever reviewed a lipid panel, if you had one drawn by your primary doctor or another doctor, you notice that it has several subtypes that are reported. In addition to the total cholesterol, there's also a number that's listed under LDL, a number listed under HDL, and then a number listed under triglycerides. And sometimes more detailed lipid panels will have other values um, reported. Um, the distinction between these types of cholesterol numbers is that, well, let's take it a step back. So it's cholesterol is not soluble in the blood, meaning it tra it's transported in the blood in molecules called the lipoproteins. Lipoproteins vary in density based on their molecular component. So the higher protein, less fat molecules are higher in density, otherwise known as HDL uh, cholesterol particles. And then the lower density cholesterol particles are ones that have less protein and more cholesterol and more fat com uh, component in them. Um, and so you can see that, and, and there's also, the triglycerides are also something that's reported in the lipid panel. And this is not a type of cholesterol, it's actually a type of fat, but it is elevated, especially if you've ever done um, a lipid panel or blood test for your cholesterol. When you're not fasting, you'll notice that's elevated. And the reason that it's important is because not only is high triglycerides associated with increased risk of heart disease, 
but sometimes if it's very elevated, it can interfere with the reporting of the other cholesterol numbers on your lipid panel, specifically the LDL. Um, other blood tests that we will sometimes use in special scenarios are the apolipoprotein B and the LP little a values. And there's a separate blood test that are not reported on a routine lipid panel. Apolipoprotein B is a molecule that's embedded in the LDL lipoprotein, and it's highly correlated with an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. So we may consider checking it in certain cases, especially when I mentioned the triglyceride uh, being elevated can interfere with the accuracy of the LDL reporting. In those scenarios, apolipoprotein B may be helpful. Um, LP little a is a, another special blood test you can get, which you don't have to be fasting for, but essentially it's measuring the level of another type of lipoprotein, special lipoprotein, uh, LP little a, um, that's depicted, it's a third small molecule that you'd see on the right in the diagram there. And it is associated or has a component of it, uh, of apolipoprotein A involved in it, hence its name. Um, and typically I will check the LP little A as an added assessment to someone's risk for cardiovascular disease if they have family history of premature coronary disease, meaning somebody in their family, like a first degree relative, had early onset heart disease. So when should you be screened? So children and teens, um, typically we will have screen them every five years, starting at the age of nine, based on the guidelines. But this will vary, of course, dependent on family history. If there is a strong family history of early heart, heart disease, you may consider having the pediatrician check your children or your teenagers' cholesterol levels a little bit earlier. Um, in men and women, uh, typically we start checking the cholesterol every one to two years between the ages of 45 to 55 years in men. And of course, every year after the age of 65. And then in women, every one to two years between the ages of 55 to 65, and then every year after age 65. And the reason we start a little bit later in women is sort of 55 to 65 is that time of perimenopause in a lot of women. And we do know that the cholesterol does change. Um, and in general, there's a huge metabolic shift with the change in hormones after menopause. Okay. Um, so once we get these cholesterol values, your provider or your cardiologist may talk to you about your risk of coronary disease using these values. So let's, so estimating your risk of ASCVD, that the ASCVD is an acronym that stands for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this incorporates everything from acute coronary syndromes, which is heart attacks, um, chest pain involving angina, or otherwise known as angina, stroke, mini stroke like TIAs, peripheral arterial disease. These are all encompassed under the umbrella of cardiovascular disease. After we obtain your numbers from your cholesterol panel, um, we will plug in those numbers using this risk calculator to estimate your ASCVD risk, ASCVD risk within a 10 year span. And the calculator essentially gives you a percentile. As you can see, the calculator takes into consideration your age. Typically, the calculator has only been studied in patients between the age of 40 to 79. Um, but it'll take into consideration your age as well as your gender, your race, uh, your blood pressure, whether or not you're treated for high blood pressure. So whether the value of your blood pressure is on blood pressure medication or not. Um, as well as the numbers of the lipid panel that we talked about, your total cholesterol, your HDL, or the good cholesterol, and the LDL, and bad cholesterol, as well as any history of diabetes, whether or not you're a smoker, um, and whether or not you take aspirin. So taking all these values, the, the, cal the calculator will then give you a percentage risk of having cardiovascular disease within 10 years. Um, if that value is less than 5%, you're considered to be low risk for cardiovascular uh, events in the next 10 years. If it's greater than 20%, you're considered high. And then there's a gray area in between, um, a significant range where borderline cardiovascular risk is between five to 7.5%. Um, and intermediate is 7.5 to 20%. Um, it is important to note that this calculator was best validated in non-Hispanic whites and blacks in the United States. So it might not be as applicable to other races or ethnic groups. Once we 
evaluate your risk and we'll go into talking about how to treat it with medications. Um, the first step is taking a second look at sort of our dietary consumption of cholesterol as well as other lifestyle changes that we can make to help lower the cholesterol. So one of the recommendations in lowering cholesterol in addition to if medication is appropriate is changing and following a heart healthy diet. So what does that really mean? Essentially, it means focusing more on plants and less on animal-based food products. Um, it means reducing the intake of saturated fats and avoiding trans fats, uh, limiting red meat and dairy products made with whole milk, um, limiting fried foods. If you're going to cook with oils, choosing vegetable oils, olive oils, um, and reducing the amount of refined carbohydrates or simple carbohydrates, which is for, for in our uh, diet would be white bread, white rice, white pasta, and eating more complex carbohydrates, which is whole grain based pasta, bread, barley, quinoa, uh, increasing your fiber intake to 30 to 45 grams a day. We know that diets high, higher in fiber, lower your triglycerides and your post meal glucose. Um, eating more fruits and vegetables. I think we've been hearing that since childhood, but really trying to focus on getting two to three servings of both vegetables and fruits, those in and of itself have fiber. Um, and then of course, all this, and of course, limiting sodium and sugary foods and beverages like sodas and juices. Um, and of course this goes hand in hand with Chain, making other healthy lifestyle changes, which includes increasing the amount of exercise um, that you do, the recommended 150 minutes a week by the WHO, uh, quitting smoking, because we know that smoking in itself, the nicotine increases the levels of LDL and lowers the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, um, losing weight and maintaining a good, healthy uh, sleep hygiene. So after we talk about heart healthy diet, the next step is talking about medications that we use uh, to lower cholesterol. Um, I wanna talk about just the medication uh, uh, buckets that we have, that we can use the tools that we have to use to lower cholesterol, starting with the one that has been the cornerstone of lowering cholesterol um, for many, many decades, uh, and that being the statin medications. Why do we talk about statins? Why do all, all the providers that you talk to, why statins sort of the first medication they bring up when talking about how to lower your cholesterol? Because there's robust data that it stabilizes atherosclerotic disease. What does this mean? Going back to that first picture when we talked about the buildup of plaque with high cholesterol, depicted in this picture here, you can see that left side, we see that uh, on the, we have the artery with the formation of that yellow plaque. In patients that weren't on statins, whose cholesterol levels continue to rise, there's formation of fibro, fatty, not very dense plaque formation that builds up and is unstable and can and it's more fragile and can result in rupture and clot formation, hence a heart attack. Statins have been shown through serial monitoring with CAT scans of patients that were taking statins that taking a statin actually made that plaque more dense and more calcified and essentially more stable. So that reduces your risk of having a heart attack or stroke or an acute event. Statins work in the means by means of inhibiting that first step in cholesterol synthesis in our liver. Um, it's generally well tolerated. Um, I know many patients have concerns about the side effects of statins, but 85 to 9% of patients that are on statins tend to tolerate it pretty well. Um, we also know that reducing LDL, which statins have been shown to do actually reduces or reducing LDL with a statin actually reduces cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular disease across several clinical trials. Talking about side effects though, in the patients that do develop side effects, the most common side effect that patients have is muscle related, usually muscle pain. Some patients may complain of joint pain. Um, the Incidence of the side effect of the muscle related uh, side of the muscle related side effect of statins is varies just because it's a subjective thing and there's no 
it, there's a variability in how patients categorize the symptoms that they have, but um, the range is considered to be, the incidence is considered anywhere between 0.3 to 33%. It hasn't been really, we couldn't narrow it down further just because of the variability and how it's been reported. You know, there's other side effects that people are concerned about. Um, one of the common other side effects that people mention is uh, the risk of diabetes associated with um, statins. And this was further studied, and it seems that it did raise the hemoglobin A1C, which is the way we diagnose diabetes, in patients that were already had one or more risk factors for diabetes. So although it may seem like it accelerated the diagnosis of diabetes in patients that were taking statins, ultimately, it pales when you talk, when you look at the amount of reduction of coronary disease and cardiovascular disease that statins have. So essentially the benefit outweighed the risk in a lot of those patients. Um, so let's talk about the different statins um, because there's many on the market. Some of the more common ones that people are treated with are atorvastatin, otherwise known as Lipitor, Resuvastatin, otherwise known as Crestor, um, and Simvastatin, uh, otherwise known as Zocor. And you can see that the various doses have sort of are have different uh, efficacy in lowering the LDL. So the low intensity statins, like pravastatin, simvastatin, the ones on the right column, at those doses reduce your LDL, we can expect probably less than 30%. In the high intensity category, so we're talking the high doses, the higher doses of Lipitor and Crestor, um, we can expect more than 50% reduction in the LDL uh, when taken appropriately. And then that middle bucket is where we have sort of the middle moderate doses um, and we can expect about 30 to 49% reduction with those doses. So this is a helpful diagram if you are already on a statin to sort of compare what your goal, what you're able to achieve in terms of LDL reduction with the dose that you're taking. Other medications that have helped lower cholesterol used in conjunction with the statin or sometimes in patients that don't tolerate statins used in place of are Zetia and newer injectable medications for P that are PCSK9 inhibitors, known as Repatha or Praluent. So Zeti is an oral medication. It works in the way of reducing cholesterol absorption through the gut, and we can expect that the LDL levels will, will be lowered by Zeti alone by uh, 20%. Um, and these medications have actually been studied in clinical trials and actually have shown to help improve or reduce cardiovascular risk um, or reduce further cardiovascular um, events in patients that do already have cardiovascular risk. Um, PCSK9 inhibitors, the Repatha or Praluent, uh, work by binding to the PCSK9 and inhibiting the labeling of LDL receptors for degradation. And so you're allowing the LDL receptors to take the LDL and uh, absorb it. So you're lowering the, the LDL in the blood. And several trials have actually shown that Repatha and Praluent reduce cardiovascular risk in patients that have already established uh, coronary disease or a recent MI. So these medications, especially if you already have coronary disease used in conjunction, have been shown to have significant benefits in reducing your risk of having further events. Um, so let's talk about primary prevention. So when we say primary prevention, that means you haven't been diagnosed yet with any of those cardiovascular events that we talked about, stroke, chest pain, angina, atherosclerotic, coronary atherosclerosis, or peripheral arterial disease. Um, in the, when we talk about primary prevention, we're talking about take, using medications and lowering your cholesterol in order to prevent those events from happening in the first place. So statins and other, the other non statin medications we talked about are used in, and we're gonna talk about the different categories of patients that it's been helpful in reducing the cholesterol numbers to prevent these events from happening. So these are, this is based on the guidelines that were published in uh, 2013 and again in 2018. Um, in patients that have severe hypercholesterolemia, meaning already you're coming in with a high, you, get your lipid panel checked, your LDL is greater than 190. A high intensity statin, so if you if you remember back, going back to our slide with the three categories of intensities of statins, taking a high intensity statin is recommended for patients that are aged 
between 20 to 75 years with an LDL already equal to or greater than 190. If after you check that cholesterol in three, four to 12 weeks after your LDL still remains above 100, despite taking the, the statin medication, you can consider adding Zetia. Um, of course, not everyone will tolerate the statin, in which case you can use a Zetia. But if there is another risk factor or the, and the LDL still remains of 100, whether or not you tolerate the statin and after adding Zetia or the, uh, the Zetia, then you can consider doing the injectable PCSK9 inhibitor, the pralium and the Repathal that we talked about. Let's talk about another category of patients that we know are, uh, have been helped by the addition of cholesterol medication to help lower their risk of coronary disease. These are patients with diabetes. Regardless of what your risk is based on the risk calculator, a moderate intensity statin therapy is recommended in patients that have diabetes because we know that diabetes is one of those major risk factors that increases your risk of having a cardiovascular event. If you have a, if a patient has multiple risk factors such as smoking, um, obesity, uh, high blood pressure, family history of early onset heart disease, we may consider go ahead and ju jumping to the high intensity statin to, to lower their risk. Typically, I will aim for a cholesterol or an LDL level less than 100 in these patients. And then the next group of patients that benefit from cholesterol lowering medication for primary prevention are that category of patients between the ages of 40 to 75 without diabetes with an LDL that's less than 190, so between 70 and 190. Then that brings us back to that ASCVD risk calculator that we talked about. So this is a shared decision. This is where that discussion between you and as a patient and your provider can talk about where your cholesterol numbers are, where your other risk factors are, use the ASCVD calculator to predict your risk of having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years and seeing if statin medication or the alternative medications if you can't tolerate that are appropriate for you. In the 2018 update of the cholesterol guidelines, they actually recommended using, and this is tiny print, but they recommended using risk enhancing factors to better find the patients that will benefit from cholesterol lowering medications rather than just using the calculator in itself. Because the calculator doesn't really take into consideration a lot of other important risk factors. Um, this includes having family history of a first degree relative that we talked about having had a stroke or heart attack, um, having metabolic syndrome, meaning your triglycerides are elevated above 150. You also have the risk factors of an elevated blood pressure, elevated glucose, low HDL. We know that all of these factors are increase your risk of cardiovascular events, having chronic kidney disease, having chronic inflammatory conditions like HIV, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in women specifically, having early onset premature menopause before the age of 40 uh, or having um, pregnancy associated conditions like preeclampsia increases your risk of uh, cardiovascular events down the road. South Asian ancestry, there's is a high risk race or ethnicity that's not included or taken into consideration in the calculator. So that's another risk enhancing factor where it would in, maybe increase or maybe would encourage you to take a cholesterol lowering medication to reduce your risk down the road. And of course, there's other blood tests that we talked about on that sort of bottom half of that table, um, LP little a, APOB as risk further more detailed assessment to see if they're elevated to either encourage you or say if they're normal, taking that as a positive um, factor in not potentially waiting to start a statin. Um, having uh, one of the other blood tests that I want to point out is the C-reactive protein, the high sensitive C-reactive protein is a blood test, but it can be a sign of increased inflammation, which we know that inflammation is bad and can result in increased risk of uh, coronary events. So while after that, we talked about doing the risk calculator, talked about the risk enhancing factors, it's still sort of gray uh, about whether or not you will benefit from a cholesterol lowering medication. One of the tests your provider may order is a coronary artery calcium score. This is a CAT scan, um, which, in that, which is that black and white diagram is basically depicting what 
the results of this would could show. Um, we know that especially as you get older, this plaque formation we already talked about that fatty the fatty plaque formation that yellow part of the building within the lumen of the, the vessel, but over time that can get calcified, um, and oftentimes that plaque is associated with calcium deposits as well. If we're in that gray area where we're borderline to intermediate risk based on the risk calculator, not that many risk enhancing factors to really encourage taking a medication, but we really want to take a, a step further and see what your risk is or really see if you need to be on a cholesterol lowering medication and the calcium, uh, the coronary artery calcium score can be beneficial. And essentially it's a, like I mentioned, it's a CAT scan and the radiologist or whoever's reading it will take the cumulative of the calcium deposits that they see within the coronary arteries in your heart. Um, and that's usually uh, given to you as a absolute number. And then we'll also report your percentile in comparison to other people with your age and gender. So if the score is greater than a hundred or it's greater than or equal to the 75th percentile with the age match, the age and sex matched, those are the patients that may benefit from a cholesterol lowering medication. Say on the other hand, the calcium score is zero. And it's actually reasonable to hold off on holding and starting cholesterol lowering medications for a period of time. Of course, it's still recommended to monitor your lipid panel every year, but you may be able to delay starting a medication if your calcium score is zero. Of course, it's important to note that the calcium artery, the coronary artery calcium score test does not exclude or evaluate non-calcified plaque. So there is plaque formation, especially in younger individuals. Plaque might already be start to be forming, but if there's no calcium associated with it, we're not gonna be able to pick it up on the, the coronary artery calcium score. So in these individuals, it may underestimate your ASCVD risk. Okay. And lastly, sort of a category that um, we, I had mentioned before, if you already have had a heart attack or stroke, or you have blockages in your arteries and your legs, peripheral arterial disease, other uh, known otherwise, um, then the, the recommendation is to lower your LDL by more than 50% using the high intensity statin. We know lower is better. Our goal would be to bring your LDL down below 70. Um, so if it's still remaining above 70 after taking the maximum tolerated dose, then we would consider adding the Zetia or the PCSK9 inhibitors or the injectables to further achieve that goal of bringing it down because we know the lower is better. And we know that especially in the, in the table on the right depicts patients that are very high risk for having future coronary events, anybody that's had a heart attack within the last year, uh, anybody that's had a stroke or um, peripheral arterial disease, or if you have other risk factors for diabetes, currently smoking, chronic kidney disease, we know all of these will increase your risk of having another event. So aiming for and being more aggressive about lowering your LDL less than 70 is key in preventing these events again. And I thought this was just a helpful tool. Um, you can find this on the AHA website, heart.org slash cholesterol. It's a, basically a sheet a worksheet you can take to your next primary doctor appointment or your next cardiology appointment. It uh, allows you to sort of see what changes you can make from a lifestyle standpoint, talking about giving you an outline of how to discuss your cholesterol numbers and what they need, and then seeing what your plan of action is and if that does involve medications and then talking about the side effects. Um, and of course, a big thing is cost too. So, you know, talking to your insurance company and your pharmacy to figure out the cost is an important thing because Prescribing the medication is one step, but of course you want to make sure that it fits your lifestyle and something that you'll be able to continue to take. So that's all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing. Wow, that was a lot of information and that was great, Dr. Aluri. Thank you very much. If you can take down your, whoa, there you are. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have an incredible audience tonight and they are submitting a lot of really, really good questions. So let me first sort of apologize to the audience. Uh, often what I try to do is I try to put questions together. So it may not seem that I'm passing along your precise question, but I'm going to be passing along the general topic that you uh, that you brought up. So 
Dr. Lurie, if you're ready, I'm going to start tossing questions your way, and let's see how many of these we can get through. Okay. Someone asked a, a really good question. Does it matter when, what time of day you would take a statin or aspirin, if that's what you've been asked to take by your doctor? Should you take them in the morning? Should you take them in the evening? Does it make a difference? Yeah. So often, I think traditionally, the statins have been recommended to take in the evening. I think that has to do with sort of the thought is the production of cholesterol happens more in the nighttime. But at the end, when you take a, let, take a look at the cumulative benefit of statins, I don't think it really matters as long as you remember to take. And I think that's the most challenging part of any medication that you take on a daily basis is remembering to take it. So if you take all of your medications in the morning, maybe it's best to take the statin in the morning so you remember to take it rather than it being the only medication you for, keep forgetting to take in the evening. Right. And and here's one that, that I often get as well. And, and boy, I, I'm not sure how to answer this. Uh, it's based on our knowledge is always changing. But if you've been advised by your physician, for whatever reason, maybe you're in a high risk group to be on a statin because your cholesterol is high and it can't be controlled with diet or for whatever reason, does that mean you are on a medication for life? Are you going to be on it forever for the rest of your life? Um, yeah. And often patients think, well, my cholesterol is lower now. Can I stop the medication? I think that's a great question. Um I get this question a lot and no medication I say is for life, right? Because things changed on the road, 10, 20 years, blood, same thing with blood pressure medication, same thing with cholesterol medication. Sometimes, especially when I'm using in patients that for primary prevention, meaning you haven't had a heart attack or stroke or peripheral arterial disease, it may it's something that we reevaluate once you get to be older than 79, like 80 and above, how much benefit are we really deriving? Because the studies are not that great in the older population, the 80s and 90s, especially if you haven't had an event. We saw this with aspirin already. We saw that it's sort of being debunked, so to speak, as a primary prevention tool. Um, so same thing with statin. I think if you haven't had an event already, it's something to definitely reevaluate after a certain age. Here's a, This is a topic that comes up, I think, in, in whatever talk you're giving as it relates to cardiology. It doesn't matter what the topic is, but it has to do with alcohol and, and drinking a little bit of wine. And, and someone said, well, can a little bit of wine adversely affect your lipid levels, your cholesterol? Um, it might, someone told me it should, and, and uh, you know, is it okay to have a little bit of wine as it relates to hyperlipidemia? We'll limit it the, the question to that topic. Yeah, and I think it's important to be realistic about this because we, although we would like to say as providers, no alcohol, the truth is no alcohol, no amount of alcohol is healthy for you. We know that, but it is an important part of people's lifestyle, and I, we respect that. Um, in terms of if it's adversely would affect your cholesterol, I think if you are drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, obviously we know it's bad for your blood pressure. We know it's bad for certain arrhythmias. It can, it will just like any other simple carburetor, increase your cholesterol as well. Um, excessive amounts bad, but once in a while, a glass would not, in my opinion, be harmful. Hey, you, you answered that delicately and thank you. <laughs> um, here's a great question and, and it's one. Um, that I think the answer is important. And it really relates to the question of statins. What do they do to atherosclerotic plaques? Do they stop the disease in its tracks? Is there such a thing as atherosclerotic regression, meaning can there be a melting away of these plaques, of this cholesterol in the arteries? Uh, you know, do, what's the breakdown on that? What do you tell patients in terms of sort yeah. of the natural history and the long term? effects of statins. Yeah. So this goes back to that one slide that I had showed what that sort of differences in plaque and how the plaque look in patients that took statins versus those that didn't. And this was really depicted. Now we have coronary CTAs, which is a CAT scan that really looks and delves into sort of the makeup of this plaque. So we can actually see over time what happens to patients that take statins. And it's not that the plaque itself melts away. It's more that it becomes denser and it makes it more stable. So that reduces your risk of plaque rupture and heart attack. Yeah. You know, if you look at some older studies though, and actually some newer studies, at least what I tell patients, and you can tell me whether you agree with me, is, is I tell them that, you know, we make decisions based on evidence-based medicine, and that's looking at tens of thousands of patients. And, and we can't say what's going to happen to one particular individual, but generally, with effective statin therapy with lipid lowering, the data would say that we can get some regression of plaque in about a third of patients. 
-hmm. We can stop the disease in about a third of patients. And no matter what we do, the disease is going to progress in about a third of patients. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's fair um, because we can't say for, again, none of us have a magic eight ball, but in, when you look at the larger trials, I think there is some data definitely to support that there is regression of plaque. Um, of course, we can't promise that in everybody, but yes. Of course. Um, some uh, There are a couple of questions about uh, some of the sub uh, subfragments. So like how often should you be looking at LP little a? Should you always be getting an apolipoprotein B uh, with annual blood tests, or is that something that just needs to be done once? Yeah, so the LP little a would be checked once. There's no evidence. It doesn't really change over someone's lifetime. Like I said, it's genetically predetermined. So I usually will just check it once. The apolipoprotein B, just like you would check your lipid panel and get the LDL, may be helpful to track, especially if we feel like the LDL is not accurate enough. But I typically in a routine lab don't check it unless there's any reason to like if triglycerides are elevated and I feel like the LDL is not accurate or there's a heavy, a strong family history of premature uh, coronary disease and I'll check it. But I find that in those cases, the LP little a is actually more beneficial. Um, several food and diet questions. Um, I think you answered a lot of them in your talk. The, uh, the question of eggs always comes up. Um, yeah. <laughs> eggs good, bad, or indifferent? So eggs are a great source of protein, but the egg itself, the yellow part, the egg yolk, actually has a high amount of saturated fat in it, which is why excessive amounts are not good for you and for good for your cholesterol. So I tell patients, if you can try to stay away from it, just try to use egg whites and maybe mix in a yolk if you really need it, that's fine. But the, the egg yolk is not as healthy. Great. Another question that I get a lot, and you answered the risk of diabetes with statins, but there's also the question of memory loss. You know, do statins help memory? Do they hurt memory? Um, you know, as folks get older, they they do have some cognitive impairment. Is that just aging? Is, I know, that's hard. That's a yeah. tough one because I think initially when they started looking at the statins, that did be come up as an alert as potential side effect. But when they actually study this over a longer term, it's hard because there's other confounding variables. Uh, these medications are used in people that are aging and we know that memory loss to different degrees is associated with aging. So I don't think we can de definitely correlate that to statins or say that statins cause that based on the evidence that we have. And in fact, there is some data that would suggest the opposite. Right, exactly. It may yeah. reduce dementia. So it's it's an open issue and I'm not trying to answer the questions for you. No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there is one there is one class of drugs that you didn't uh, mention and uh, someone did ask they they are on next uh, nexlatol that's uh, bem, uh, bempedoic acid a fairly new addition to the medications yeah. that we use to lower cholesterol. Do you want to just briefly touch upon that? Yeah, so bempedoic acid actually has been in 2022 is when the data actually came out that it's beneficial for cardiovascular outcomes in patients that can't tolerate statin. It's an oral medication, um, so that's definitely more attractive than the PCSK9s, which are injectable. Um, but for me, cost has been an issue in sort of prescribing that to patients. Um, so I still will go down the line of trying to do the injectable if a patient can tolerate it, but some patients just don't like the idea of injecting needles, which I totally understand. So in that case, uh, epidoic acid is definitely beneficial. And I think more data will come out in terms of its benefits. Yeah, you know, and, and there are some questions here about, well, if I'm statin intolerant, and you may want to explain to folks what statin intolerant means, because I know I hear that a lot. They've taken one statin and they've gotten some muscle aches and they say, I can never take another one. And you try to get them on a medication that requires some approval from their insurance company and they don't get approved. So, um, so sort of the, what does statin intolerant really mean? You know, how, yeah. how do you have to document that a patient cannot take statins yeah. um, in order to get them approved for some of the newer medications? Yeah. So not taking one statin medication and not tolerating it, which fortunately wouldn't suffice unless it was a major adverse event. If there was muscle breakdown, we can prove that. So then um, we can talk to an insurance company about bypassing sort of all the other steps that we'd have to take otherwise. But say if this was just a minor side effect like muscle aches, that we would have to document at least trying one or two other statins before we can 
before, and generally speaking, the insurance company will approve the other medications, specifically injectables. Right. That's, I think that's the take home point for patients. And, you know, a lot of times you say, look, you just need to try this. We need to, we just need to be able to document that you can't tolerate it. And those unfortunately are the hoops we have to jump through. Um, and it's not us yeah. folks. It's not, it's not <laughs> the docs. Believe me, it's, we'd love you all to be on whatever medication you need to be on. Uh, another question really just relates to if, if I really just don't want to take medication and I've been told I have a high cholesterol, you know, has, I'm going to ask it as a two, two part question. Number one, what else can you do? And you touched upon some of those things, but is there any data that says lowering your cholesterol through diet and exercise reduces your risk? Um, we know that eating a heart healthy diet, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising for the recommended amount does reduce your risk of mortality and cardiovascular events, but I think it has more to do with lowering the cholesterol numbers as a the way of benefiting it in addition to lowering your, because if you're maintaining a healthy weight and exercising, most likely you're also managing a healthy blood pressure. So I think it has to do with the fact that you're modifying your other risk factors as well. Um, but at the end of the day, based on the numbers that we talked about in the guidelines, it really goes back down to that. What is your risk of 10, a 10 year risk? And if your risk is elevated, then there's only so much you can really do with the diet and exercise, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, a, a good question here. You know, we know that HDL is a little bit protective, um, right. but does having a high HDL, um, outpower, uh, the risk of having an extremely high LDL as well. I don't think we have enough data to prove that if your HDL is elevated, it can offset the adverse effect of an elevated LDL. Um, it is protective in the sense that HDL, just by the nature of the protein, does reduce the plaque formation. But again, if we know that LDL does create those plaques. So if you do have an elevated LDL along with HDL, I still think you would be, there's no data to say that that would actually reduce your risk of cardiovascular effect. Yeah. These folks, these folks are, are lobbing some tough questions here. I'm just warning you, you're going to, you're going to be drenched <laughs> in sweat when we're done here tonight. Um, <laughs> so does stress um, exacerbate uh, hyperlipidemia or increase the risk of vascular disease? I think indirectly stress can increase your inflammatory markers. We talked about the high sensitive CRP. Um, so we know that when the body's under stress, there's increased inflammatory markers and inflammation is bad. It creates more susceptibility for plaque rupture. Um, so yes, I do think that it, while indirectly, it can increase your risk of vascular events. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find some of these other questions. <laughs> they're, they're coming at us fast and furious. Um, so if you're taking a statin, and, and this is going to get a little detailed, but one of the things we look at uh, or is liver function, because that's where the statins work. And so if you've had elevated transaminases or, or liver function tests when you're taking a statin, is there anything you can do to reduce that so you can stay on the statin? Uh, yes. So... So it really depends. I have seen mild elevation in the liver function tests because we typically will check the liver function right. test at least once after you start the statin, but it really has to be like a two or three fold increase before that really sets the brakes on the statin for me. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything different you can really do about the statin. We could always try doing a lower dose of the statin to see if it'll help. But I don't typically recommend changing or altering the dose of the statin just based on mild elevation in the liver. But I will monitor it with a repeat uh, set of labs. Down are, you, are you a believer in coenzyme Q? I'm not. Um, I, I, it doesn't. It's not harmful. There are some people that feel that coenzyme Q does help them. They believe that it helps them tolerate the medication better. There's no harm. Um, as long as you're not taking any medications that it could interact with. Um, but I don't think it actually has been proven to benefit or lower statin related effects. I agree with that. Um, someone, someone asked, and this is a good question. So how often 
should you get a coronary calcium score? And I guess it's a loaded question. It depends on what the score was. Let's make believe, I'll change the question. Let's make believe I'm age 50 mm -hmm. and I have a family history and my cholesterol is borderline and you put me into a risk calculator and I don't have an, uh, you know, an elevated risk and I get a coronary calcium score done and it's zero. Mm -hmm. um, but my LDL cholesterol is 140. Right. Um, how often should I get a coronary calcium score done? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that typically with my practice, I've been also checking LP little a. So let's just assume that that's normal okay. too, but <laughs> thank you. I feel <laughs> much better now, <laughs> <laughs> but typically I will check it again in five years. Um, that's not like a hardball number, but in that scenario, it, after discussion, taking a look at sort of other risk factors, if everything else is not a negative risk factor for coronary disease, then I think doing it again in five years is reasonable. Right. Um, there is some data out there that says a coronary calcium score of zero, depending on the age, is a very good marker for very low risk for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, five yeah. years, 10 years. Um, but once, but here's a, here's a follow up question. This will be mine. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I'm 50 years old. I have that cholesterol of 140. I get a coronary calcium score and it's 185. And you tell me, hey, Warren, you know, you've got some early coronary disease, you need to be on a statin, we need to get your LDL real low, and um, you need to take a low dose aspirin a day. Is there any value in me? And you're going to do some other testing, we, we don't have to go into that. But should I be getting serial coronary calcium scores? Does that give us any additional information at that point, once we know that I've got something going on? Once that you've sort of crossed that threshold, specifically for me from a calcium score standpoint, and it's over a hundred, I don't think that doing more calcium scores really changed the recommendation. Um, and that, that's just the knowing, I, I don't think it would really alter what the recommendation would be in terms of starting a medication for me. I totally agree with you. Um, so are there any, this is a good question because I don't know the answer. Um, are there any medications that increase LDL? Other medications. Other medications increase LDL. Mm. Well, how about how about let's talk about thyroid disease because that's the right. you know that's the only thing I can think of. So, um, how does thyroid disease and and lipid levels uh, correlate with each other? How's that? that yeah. yeah. So. Any thyroid abnormality, but specifically if you have hypothyroidism, we have seen that that can affect your cholesterol numbers and make your cholesterol numbers higher. So in those scenarios, rather than addressing the cholesterol right away, unless of course there's imminent danger or if someone's just had a heart attack, that's different. But say for primary prevention purposes, in those scenarios, I'd actually have the patient evaluate and get their thyroid address first before, and then check their lipids again after that, because we know that the thyroid isn't interfering with the the lipid production. Right. Um, a question here about weight in general. Um, is there a correlation between weight and lipid levels? Meaning if you're skinny, does that mean you have a lower cholesterol? And if you are the opposite of skinny, it means you're going to have a high cholesterol? Not at all. Unfortunately, that's there. I do think that because just kind of thinking about my own patient panel of patients that have high cholesterol, there are some that are maintaining a healthy weight. And I think there is a genetic component to it. But we do know that that metabolic syndrome, which is being overweight, having high triglycerides, having low HDL is a risk factor for coronary disease. But um, definitely being overweight does increase your risk of having higher cholesterol, but being skinny necessarily doesn't mean you're protected. A couple more questions about, about diet. Um, does the fiber source matter when it comes to lowering cholesterol? This particular patient has been focusing on berries, beans, legumes, and chia seeds. And someone else asked, um, and I, you answered this uh, in your talk, but maybe just to reiter reiterate, you know, what foods would you suggest to help reduce cholesterol or, you know, what goes into a heart healthy diet? Yeah. So I think going back to that fiber, I think the source doesn't really matter. There's some people that will use Metamucil, which is I mean, it's sort of a supplement, I guess, per se, for to increase their fiber intake. Um, but um, heart healthy diet, again, more plant based, reducing the animal products, less butter, olive oil. There's this, there was, you know, definitely Mediterranean diet has been shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes, but 
that essentially is that in that region specifically, they eat a lot of fish. They're more, uh, they use olive oil for their cooking, more vegetables, more whole grains. Um, so although it may not be completely applicable to our diet culture in the United States, I think focusing on vegetables and whole grains and using, getting lean sources of proteins, whether that be beans, um, like that person had mentioned, or chicken or fish um, and mixed nuts. There's a lot of different ways you can get lean proteins and avoid to avoid uh, the red meats and bacon um, and other processed meats. Oh, you said it. You said a dirty word. Okay. Do <laughs> um, <laughs> so you still have a little energy left? We're we're, we're getting towards yeah. the end here. Um, yeah. Good question. Um, I'm going to make it bigger. Uh, I'll take the liberty of doing that. Uh, menopause was asked as a question, but let's talk about estrogens in general and hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. um, the effects on lipids, and you know, what do you what do you tell female patients who uh, are thinking of hormone replacement therapy? And does the point in time when women go through menopause affect their lipid levels? So not necessarily lipid levels. Well, I think indirectly, but if you hit menopause at an earlier age, like less than forty, that's definitely a negative risk factor, meaning it does increase your risk of coronary disease. And we do know that with menopause and the hormonal changes, there's definitely a change in that cholesterol, their lipid uh, panel makeup. So, you know, if you are considering hormone replacement therapy, I think if you've had history of a coronary event, I would not recommend it. If it is something that uh, you're considering and haven't had any primary cardiovascular events, then it definitely is worthwhile to check in with your primary provider or cardiologist about making sure that the rest of your um, risk factors are well controlled for coronary disease, which means making sure your lipids well managed and your screening for diabetes and your blood pressure is um, within normal limits, just because you want to reduce all the risk factors while you're starting the hormone replacement therapy. This question goes a little bit beyond cholesterol, and you can say pass if you'd like, um, but certainly okay. cigarette smoking is a major risk factor for, for vascular disease. How about yeah. vaping? How about vaping? Uh, fairly... So uh, if common. we, yeah, so if, um, if we're vaping nicotine products, then that nicotine in and of itself has been shown to increase LDL. So I would probably go, it'd be safe to assume that that same nicotine that's in cigarette is in vaping and that would probably alter or negatively alter your cholesterol as well. Someone asked like, what's the best test to measure plaque? And you went through a few of these, um, but I'm going to change that question and to to highlight the importance of what we need to know as cardiologists isn't whether you have a blockage in a coronary artery. What we need to know is, is that blockage causing a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So once you know someone has coronary disease, they have buildup of this atherosclerotic plaque in their arteries, then you're going to treat them for secondary prevention, which you talked about lowering the cholesterol, heart healthy diet, low dose aspirin. But what is it you're really gonna be following that's gonna tell you whether we need to do anything else? Yeah, so this is what the, brings us to the next type of functional tests. I think like Dr. Levy mentioned, we wanna see if that blockage is compromising blood flow to the heart muscle tissue. So we can do this in means of a stress test as simple as putting you on a treadmill in the office with an EKG attached and if while you are doing your the exercise on the treadmill, if we notice that there's changes in the EKG, that can be indicative that your heart muscle is crying for some more blood and oxygen. So there could be that could be that that blockage is actually significant. Um, there's other also in the last few years, in the last decade, the coronary CT has become helpful in the sense that it gives you a better percentage of what the blockage is. And now they have special tests that they can do in order to see if there's actually compromise of blood flow too. So I think that's also helpful. Yeah. Um, is, are there any medications or is there anything you can do in terms of lifestyle changes to raise your HDL? Mm -hmm. So exercise has definitely been shown to increase your HDL. Um, so we don't want to minimize that, uh, medications that to actually increase your HDL are not recommended mostly because of intolerance. Um, to the medication. So in generally speaking, I don't actually prescribe any medications like niacin nice in my practice to increase the HDL just because I just don't think they would be well tolerated. But those, to answer the question of whether it would increase your HDL, it can. Yeah, you know, that's a great question, niacin, uh, because that's something that through my career, the pendulum has swung markedly in opposite directions. 
Um, mm -hmm. If I'm on niacin, uh, should I keep taking it? Is there any benefit? Is Has it been shown to be beneficial? Yes, it's beneficial in the sense that it will increase your HDL, but it, if you're tolerating it, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, if you're tolerating it, then you can continue to take it. Of course, there's interactions with other medications, which sometimes makes it a little bit more challenging to continue it. But as long as all those variables are okay, then I think it's fine to continue. All right. Um, if I've gotten a coronary, uh, a, 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 a coronary CTA, a, a CT scan of my coronary arteries, mm -hmm. and it tells me that there is a, oh, a 30 to 50 percent blockage or a 50 to 70 percent blockage. Um, yeah. Does that have significant prognostic? Um, you know, does it does it predict that I'm going to have an event or is just having a blockage put me at a higher risk group? I, that's a little bit off from cholesterol. Sorry. No, that's OK. I um, That's a good question. Um, whether that 20 to 30 percent blockage predicts that you're going to have a heart attack, I think, is not is putting a lot of stress on that uh, report and that test alone. Um, I think it's, I would take that as the blockage is minimal. It's likely not compromising blood flow if you're not having any symptoms. Um, but I think it's a good sign, a wake up call, so to speak, to make sure that the other risk factors are well controlled so that we can prevent progression of that. Cause that's, what's going to determine your risk of cardiovascular events down the road. Yeah. I'll take the liberty of answering, of adding on to that because I, yeah. patients get confused a lot. And I think a lot of times people think that what causes a heart attack is that you have a blockage in an artery that starts this 20%, becomes 50%, 70%, 90%, and then closes. And that's not what happens is you have a plaque, you have one of the buildup in the artery and it ruptures and a clot forms, as Dr. Allure explained before. And unfortunately, that plaque can be a 30% plaque. It can be a 50% plaque. If you're having angina, meaning chest pain when you walk or exert yourself, then you have a high-grade lesion. But just because you don't have a high-grade lesion is not a guarantee of not having a cardiac event, which is why it's so important to follow these recommendations about secondary prevention. So I went a little bit beyond my swim lane as a moderator. I'm sorry, but oh, we've, no, reached the end of our, we've reached the end of our time. And I, I really want to thank Dr. Lurie a lot for being with us tonight.